Hi, everyone. Um, looks like uh, we're live here. Uh, welcome and uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight for our event with uh, Desiree Alvarez, Anthony Cody, Jennifer Hasegawa, and Kimberly Reyes. My name is Evan Karp. I'm the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and mainstay of the San Francisco Haight Ashbury district since 1976. Tonight, though, we are, of course, here to celebrate a quartet of brilliant young writers Desiree Alvarez, Anthony Cody, Jennifer Hasegawa, and Kimberly Reyes. Um, I'm, they're each going to do a reading, and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the program. So um, we'll get started here. Maybe first, I just want to welcome all the authors. Um, it's, we've been emailing about this event for a minute, and so um, it, this is nice uh, for us all to be here together finally. Um, congratulations to all of you uh, on your books. Um, um, yes, and um, so uh, first up is um, Desiree Alvarez. Um, she's a poet and painter living in New York City. Her second book, Raft of Flame, won the Lake Merritt Poetry Prize and was published by Omnidon in April 2020. Her first book, Devil's Paintbrush, received the 2015 May Sarton New Hampshire Poetry Award. Her poetry is anthologized in What Nature and Other Musics, New Latina Poetry. She's published poems in Poetry, Lit Hub, Massachusetts Review, Boston Review, Fence, and the Iowa Review been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and received the Glenna Luce Poetry Award from Prairie Schooner. Alvarez exhibits her work widely nationally and internationally, and paintings are currently on view at Brooklyn Botanic Garden Conservatory Gallery through the end of next month. Uh, celebrating magical connections between animals, plants, and humans, her work has received three fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, a Poets House Fellowship, as well as awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and European Capital of Culture. Alvarez teaches at New York City College of Technology, CUNY, and the Juilliard School. Desiree, welcome, and congratulations. Thank you for the nice intro, and thanks for having me. And thank you, Kimberly and Jennifer, for inviting me to join in this lovely reading with you wonderful poets. I, I'm going to hold it up again, because I have voted, just to get the word out again. Uh, and... Um, so I'm going to be reading from Raft of Flame. I'm, I'm wearing my Raft of Flame bowling shirt. Um, and can you hear me? All good? OK. So uh, Halloween is coming up on Saturday. So I, I have to read a, a witch poem um, because I am a witch. Having been born on Halloween, it is my birthday. So um, I, I, I thought I'd read a few of the Kante poems in this book, which um, are poems inspired by Lorca and his Kante Yondo, or the deep song of flamenco. I have a great, great, great grandmother who was a flamenco dancer from Spain who went to Mexico. So this poem is called Kante Bruja, Witch Song. Mija, learn sorrow before learning to speak. Ashy faced bird, sharpen your spear to draw the pattern of sad, the pattern of joy, when you look at what you are made of. I don't see my face, Owl says before soaring, as the future is born of slave and colonizer on the ledge of the window. Pequeña, your flamenco mother, dances for the sea now. She left windmills to sail from Spain to Mexico dancing cigarillas under the waves. You were now an orphan. La Bruja will sing the story while you pick tobacco leaves in Mazatlan. Father will change his name each year until he vanishes. And another cante, cante without borders. All roads cry after war. I sing Spanish songs, not knowing how to pronounce the words. While the lavender moon guts the highway with her audacious harvest. And the metalsmith hammers a bouquet of steel roses for his mother. I'm going to read, this is a really short Kante. Uh, I'm going to read this for Molly, who just is a composer, who just composed a really beautiful piece of music to this. It's called Kante Dulce. The god of dust must be human, touching everything with his nearly invisible, relentlessly soft coat. 
covering us with forget. So I, I thought that I would read, you know, you have these crushes on poems. And so I thought I would read um, a poem of mine in response to a poem of each of the, my fellow poets reading tonight here, um, whose poems I have crushes on. So I'm gonna start with Jennifer, my, my pal from San Antonio. Um, and Jennifer has this amazing poem called Knife Shopping. So I'm going to read another Kante poem with a knife in it called Cante Madre, Mother's Song. He sent her the whip so she'd know it was time to come back. He sent her the black braid that once ran black down his back. She sent him the dotted scarf, red silk wrapped with a knife inside. Papa the lover, Papa the loner, Mama, you're gone. Mama, your song. And then Anthony has this amazing poem about a tree called El Arpa, a Mexican lynching. That is like this killer poem. Uh, so I'm going to read for him a poem about a tree in Mexico that I went to visit in a town called Tule, and it's called Subtraction Tree, and it's a poem about disappearing. A fable, a tree, so big all the town's children hold hands around it. The invaders are coming. We are too few to meet them. We hide the town under the tulip tree. Everyone is happy living under it, so we stay forever. A boy points out monkeys and iguanas in knots with a flashlight. Under the tree, I dream I am one of three warriors waiting to meet the army. I hear the sound of hooves. Montezuma Cypress, 2,000 years old. What have you seen? In time of drought, nuns from the church bring you their precious drinking water. The tree is getting bigger. And then Kimberly has this gorgeous ekphrastic poem with the best ever title for a poem called The Uncanny Valley. And it's a poem about an amazing Kara Walker sculpture. So I'm gonna read a, an ekphrastic poem about the, the Olmec heads and imagining what, what it must have been like for the conquistadors when they arrived in, in Mexico and saw these incredible head, huge stone heads. And it's called uh, Primero Sueño. The title comes from a Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz poem. She was an amazing um, 17th century Mexican poet and scholar. Primero sueño, first dream, on crossing, a Whitman-esque. And there's also some Whitman in it. What is it then between us? ¿Qué es entonces entre nosotros? My horse is afraid of you, and both of us are thirsty. Stone face, we cross the seas from Spain. I've been riding for days past pyramids in Mexico. Whatever it is, it avails not. Distance avails not. And place avails not. My horse and I are tired of the blistering desert. Who is your family, crowd of great heads in a field? Who has conquered you, and whom will I now conquer? Big rock, your lips look like ancient waves. Your mouth reminds me of my wife's kisses goodbye. I am lonely as the moon. Por favor, speak to me, face in the grass. I remember the first time I put my fingers inside a woman and the first time she put her fingers inside herself. I too had received identity by my body, my body, the body uncertain, my body mixed, dreaming of being a Spanish conquistador, 
dreaming of being in Olmec head, carved and mouth sealed forever. Keep your place, objects than which none else is more lasting. We plant you permanently within us, being what? In a cross, a Zarathustra, a span of scarf woven of 17 colors from what roams, what flies, what swims, and what sings, being a woman and a man, stone crafted and aqueous, being brown, being tree and flood tide, being free citizen of the body earth, electing in revolt to expand and bring down whatever rises between us. I mean, I can mean, stop right there. I think I think I'm I'm probably at time. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Desiree. Thank you. I, I love that idea um, uh, of uh, tribute poems. That was really lovely. Um, uh, so uh, next up, we've got Anthony Cody. Um, Anthony is the author of um, Borderland Apocrypha, uh, which came out in, from Omnidon in April 2020. It's the winner of the 2018 Omnidon Open Book Prize, selected by May May Bersenbrug, uh, and long listed for the 2020 National Book Award in Poetry. He's a Canto Mundo Fellow from Fresno, California, with lineage in both the Braquero program and Dust Bowl. His poetry has appeared in Gulf Coast, Ninth Letter, The Boiler, Control V, Journal, among others. Anthony is a member of the Hmong American Writers Circle and co-edited How Do I Begin, Hmong American Literary Anthology. He's a recent MFA creative writing graduate from Fresno State, where he continues to collaborate with Juan Felipe Herrera and the Laureate Lab Visual Wordist Studio. Anthony has received uh, fellowships from Canto Mundo, Community of Writers, and Desert Nights Rising Stars Conference. He provides communication support for Canto Mundo and serves as an associate poetry editor for Know Me Press. Um, welcome, Anthony, and congratulations. So exciting about, about the, the long list. And, and um, I know we're all um, uh, wishing you so much, uh, wishing you well. Thank you. Thank you. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I am reading today from the traditional lands of the Yokut people. I pay my respect to my native elders, both past and present, into this land. May each of us present continue to honor the true stewards of these lands and the land itself. Thank you so much for that introduction, Evan. Um, I just want to say thank you to Jennifer and Kimberly for manifesting this reading and emailing me and, and Desiree and being like, hey, we have this idea. Let's make it happen. And here we are. And I'm grateful to be sharing space with them today. And I don't even know how to follow Desiree after those tribute poems, which were just beautiful and grateful for that. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank you all for joining us tonight, uh, for being here with us among the host of all the Zoom things, real things, imagine things that we could be doing, that we could be resisting, that we could be, you know, working on our ballots to vote. Um, I encourage all of you to, you know, drop some questions if you want, and the four of us will try to uh, address them uh, or pivot to something else um, since it is election season. Um, what I'll be doing um, first, I'm going to share. I'll do a share screen for some of my poems, um, but I'll start with the opening poem from the collection, and I'll just say that the collection kind of is a personal and historical narrative around uh, the traumas and histories following the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and sort of how that has manifested through to this day. So this first poem is actually the opening poem of the collection. And if I can share my screen, I will do just that and go from there. Standing in line to take a passport photo, an old white man looks at me and claims I am running. Standing here because my grandpa ran away from home to sell perfume in Ozokalo at nine. In line, I am a lot of things. And since I am a lot of things, I am everything he cannot imagine. A passport photo asks me to two by two myself and capture what I am in neutral. And I recall I have yet to see 
the chambers of my heart turn tusk. An old white man is not Gil Scott Heron saying, because I always feel like running, not away, because there is no such place, is not how you pronounce exile or escapar. Looks at me how Teddy Roosevelt died coveting a white buffalo. Claims I am afraid. No, I am a wall. No, I am a mirror. I am still, so still. I'll read another poem from this opening section and you'll see the kind of footnote notation as they kind of sentence diagram cascade in from one another. Um, um, so the title will look familiar from just now. The title claims I am afraid. No, I am a wall. No, I am a mirror. Claims on gold mines in California have dropped since the 1840s. While market claims against Mexicans to go back where they came from have grown steadily. Afraid of digging for doors only opened from above or elections that ask you to be afraid. No, I am a beetle scuttling into an incising tomorrow. Are you okay? I reply. Your throat, the vocal cords before your children ask, am I am? A beetle scuttling into your throat and incising the vocal cords. Tomorrow, before your children ask, are you okay? I reply, I am. A wall is just another name for sand. I am a mirror and I ask to see myself ask to see myself, to find that I am nothing more than light telling itself I exist. Yes, I exist. Yes. Whoa, Siri just turned on. Apologies. Um, this next poem is kind of, kind of really examining some of the historical traumas and how that's manifested locally um, in Fresno, uh, where I'm coming from tonight. Um, we always have this idea of the bandit, Joaquin Marietta. Um, and one of the things in some of my research, you know, kind of coming up, I knew that there was some sense that he had been, you know, what do they say, the justice was muted out and beheaded and it's still even questioned if his head was ever taken but um, they folks had apparently had his head pickled it and went on a barnstorming uh, tour with it and this was one of the disembodied posters that I took for this poem. The title is La Corona a Mexican lynching number 47. Anything can be trophy just as anything can be ashtray coffee cup, curb, flower pot, the inside of your wrist, the inside of another's wrist. Claim anything, any thing. Witness, badge, halo, horn, colony, victim, vein, coffin, president, cadaver, the quiet breath of a body at rest, claim, 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 claim anything. Oh, all right. That's always a hard one to read for me. Um, actually, um, I'm thinking I'm going to close with a poem that uh, just got published in LitHub. Um, 
that I wrote, I want to say about 12, no, I think it was 2012, about, I started, the first draft, the idea of the draft happened about eight years ago in Texas, and I was had, at a diner with Carmen Jimenez Smith and Roberto Tejada, and uh, Roberto ordered migas, and I, the Californian, have, having actually never traveled alone outside of California was under the impression that maybe I misheard and thought he had ordered ants for us at this diner. So I just went along with it, you know, gotta play, play cool, play cool. So I did. Um, it wasn't that. So this poem is titled Eating Migas. The anvil of my ear believes we have ordered insect. I project hormiga in Texas large, bloated, delectable, without fear of a thorax collapse, raising a galaxy of crumbs, or a raindrop currenting viente, labyrinth the throat, a resurrection of ant, boot stomp, fire, flood, insecticide. The erasure is haula, a pendulum, a slow rattle racked in situ, the architecture is in the mandible. Comemos las migas, but we never talk of meal. Sabemos que cada cosa cambia cuando queremos creer. This is how we eat. Yes, how ancient the ant. Complicent tangling of flame, equipped to consume and stridulate. Unknown populace, a scrutiny to antennae the semblance of molecule of meat. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here with you all, grateful. Thank you, Anthony, that was wonderful. Um, uh, next up, we have um, uh, Jennifer Hasegawa. Uh, Jennifer is a Pushcart Prize nominated poet who has sold funeral insurance door to door and had her suitcase stolen from a plastic surgery clinic in Asuncion, Paraguay. She was born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii, and lives in San Francisco. The manuscript for her first book of poetry, La Chica's Field Guide to Bonsai Living, won the Joseph Henry Jackson Literary Award from the San Francisco Foundation. Her work has appeared in the Adroit Journal, Bamboo Ridge, Tool Review, and Vellum, and is forthcoming in Bennington Review and Jubilat. And um, I just want to say that we were um, planning to host a launch party for Jennifer's book, um, La Chica's Field Guide to Bonsai Living, I think in the first week of April or something, like 10 years ago, you know, um, and uh, we're very, very um, sad that we had to, um, that we had to uh, uh, postpone that, but we're hoping to, um, to, to host an in-person event um, uh, whenever that is possible. But for now, I'm grateful um, that Jaha has brought us all together and, and helped to organize uh, tonight's event. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jaha. And I'm- Oh gosh, thanks so much. Um, so happy to be here uh, with all of you in, in the space. Um, and my heart is actually racing right now because Come on, this is poetry, right? I think this is poetry's role. And um, I'm so grateful again. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read with you tonight um, some poems from my relatively new book, um, as well as um, some new poems that I've been working on. I know that uh, as poets, I think this is, this is the time to write and to witness and to document. And so that has definitely been going on here. So, but I'd like to open up uh, my reading with the first poem from my book and I dedicate it to all of you, beautiful people uh, coming out for poetry on a Thursday night. It's called Rockets with Rear View Mirrors. They found a lack of life on one of my planets, despite the presence of blood and water in the soil. In space, as in most things, go slow to go fast. They want to colonize Mars because it is the closest thing they have to home. I want more than an extra 39 minutes. Venusian nights last 100 days. Give me this century to comb through the sweet oil of its atmosphere 
survey its darkened lava fields. It's hot, but not hot enough to melt our resolve to really fix it this time. Propulsion units burn out, disengage, and drop to lower orbits. Molten language pollinates the voiceless to birth the supernatural. Astounding alien, clean progenitor of the new tongue of the ages, you are here. And um, this this next poem, um, I, I well, a few weeks ago, I took an online workshop with um, Lillian Yvonne Bertram, um, genius, uh, about digital poetry. And she taught us to build these programs, uh, software programs that use randomness, um, which technology is really good at, uh, to write what I call proto poems that that help us humans break out of our writing patterns and develop new language. So I built a program that I want to share with you tonight because um, it, it it fascinates me and um, it uses the um, top common nouns and adjectives from a certain person's last 3000 tweets or so and inserts them into the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll see what it uh, what it creates for us. Here we go. So the the program is here on the left. And I'm going to click run and it's going to create a proto poem for us that I'll read and hopefully it will be uh, safe <laughs> for this audience. Let's see. The Constitution of X. We, the factories of the illegal approval, in order to form a stuck governor, establish generous immigration ensure thrilled community, provide for the exclusive idea, promote the general order, secure the blessings of the weekend, to ourselves and our scandal, do ordain and establish this television for the biggest fund of Navy. And, um, Thank you, a uh, little Python program. <laughs> and um, I'll go ahead and continue. And um, this is a poem um, I wrote um, about a month ago and still working on it, but I, I'd like to share it rough as it is. It's called 2020 Visions after Ruth Bader Ginsburg and John Lewis. For the first time, the sadness is stronger than the joy. Imagine them fist fighting in the dark and what is the color of the blood of joy? What a wonder to cross the gleaming ghost line to wander where the street sweepers are now the weeping bent over gutters. Protein alleyways yield comfort no more. Losing grip on the shore, but keep pulling, pulling. Is this how you know you've lived when you can see slow motion unspooling? The wrong too strong. Wore glasses in the shower by mistake and saw the filthy walls. Scrubbed until fingers bled too foul to get clean in this life. This is how it is now, but who keeps cleaning walls that are on fire? In the milky eyes of heroes, through lids shutting like sunsets, a flash so focused that if you've seen it, you know what it is to be punched in the face by a god. See how they stride. See how they strive. See how they stillness. 
lie down in caskets to let us walk across for as long as it takes to get clean over to the other side. And I'll, I'll close with um, a, a poem that's been on my mind. Um, it's a little bit, uh, a little uh, scatological, but um, it's on my mind now. And, and um, especially around my anxiety, around keeping everyone safe, you know, but also uh, trying to stay human. It's called a black hole operator speaks. Yes, there had been salmonella, but this dining room was my place to write. Sure, it was fast food that resembled nothing of its declared origins, but whatever does. A family of eight communed over trays of colas and chalupas, Lola, arms spread across her corner booth, fired commands in Tagalog into her headset. They understood the beauty of this place that had united the taco and the fried chicken. The colonel stared out of a frame on the wall. All at once he looked black, white, Chicano, Asian, and everyone better together. Brown lumps under heat lamps. Is it chicken, corn, wood? On my tray, is it taco, pie, purse? I got a token for the bathroom. A fly occupied the space with me. I flushed and felt something on the handle. I blasted my hand with hot water. I pumped soap. I had another human shit on my finger and I started to hallucinate. Toxic shock appeared as a white stallion stomping its front hoof, imploring me to jump on. Dysentery was Madonna wanting, needing, waiting for me to justify her love. Then the Rona showed up and took me back to the afternoon in a remote bathroom at work where I found a woman at a sink washing her hands, her hands encased in thick clouds of suds like boxing gloves. She was young with red hair and a long string of pearls. She didn't look up, she didn't stop. She was washing for the end, widening that gap between herself and the final processing of what cannot be absolved, of what cannot be absorbed. Back at my table, my finger bloated and red. The ringing in my ears shook the crumbs across the mesa. 80 degrees with a dusting of wheat, dander, water, cellulose, and light. Tiny world rose up all around me. Microbes and their fine net that ensnares all the universal program to feed, reproduce, and die until we meander too close to that magnificent keeper where all things end again and again. Orbiting the rim of bent light, the family of eight, your Lola, the Colonel, a clutch of hens, and an infinity of yourselves, slowing, reddening, and finally spaghettified through the cosmic sphincter tightened by gravity herself, finally witness and subject to the alchemic singularity. The operator chuckles and shakes its head. You dumb fucks have been wasting your time keeping them separate. Purity, filth, it's all the same here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeha. That was wonderful. Um, and I want to um, uh, just give a shout out that um, uh, that Jeha made some really awesome videos uh, to accompany the book um, uh, uh, because she couldn't tour uh, when the book came out in April and uh, all the videos were shot um, while sheltering in place. And, and um, I'm going to drop the link. Uh, is, is that okay, Jeha, if I, if I drop the link? Yeah, I'll drop the link in the chat um, here now um, or shortly. But um, 
Uh, next up, we have Kimberly Reyes. And um, uh, Kimberly has received fellowships from the Poetry Foundation, the Academy of American Poets, Canto Mundo, Kalalu, the Department of Culture, Heritage, and the Gale Talked in Ireland, the Munster Literature Center, the Prague Summer Program for Writers, Summer Literary Seminars in Kenya, Community of Writers at Squaw Valley, Columbia University, San Francisco State University, and other places. She's written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Associated Press, Entertainment Weekly, Time.com, The New York Post, The Village Voice, Alternative Press, ESPN The Magazine, Film Ireland, The Echo Newspaper, RT Radio, New York One News, Entropy, The Irish Journal of American Studies, The Best American Poetry Blog, Poets.org, American Poets Magazine, The Feminist Wire, and The Stinging Fly. She's the author of the poetry collections Running to Stand Still, out from Omnidon, and Warning Coloration from Dancing Girl Press. And her nonfiction book of essays, Life During Wartime, uh, won 14 Hills, um, came out from 14 Hills, uh, was the winner of the 2018 Michael Rubin Book Award. A second generation New Yorker, Kimberly was the 2019 to 20 Fulbright's Fellow studying Irish literature and film at University College Cork. Uh, Kimberly, welcome and congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Really well done, Evan, in pronouncing Irish. That was super impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, I am experiencing the worst case of imposter syndrome ever after all of those readings. Holy cow, that is just, this is like in the most moving 60 minutes I've had in a really long time. Um, so I, okay, so I just want to start, I guess, by reminding you to support Booksmith. Um, and, you know, if you are interested in purchasing, purchasing any of our books, please support this bookstore. It's amazing. Um, and also, if you have questions about anything that you heard before, um, any poems, please put them in the chat. Um, we're going to be happy to read them after this. Um, and, oh my god, I, I just feel like, why, what am I about to do after that? <laughs> can I read these poems? Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, the poems from my book, Running to Stand Still, and then I might read some uh, newer poems. Um, and I'm going to start with a poem called The Blueprint, and I've never properly introduced this poem before. Um, and I'll just say that the Gwendolyn in this poem is Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and I read her poem, A Bronzeville Woman, when, I don't know, I was like 36 or something. Um, and I was immediately angry at the world. I was like, why has no one ever introduced me to this woman and the beauty of like just humans and what we are capable of doing before this? Um, and I was really inspired um, by the fact that she too, you know, uh, had a background in journalism before she began poetry. Um, and as a first generation college student, first generation, pretty much everything, um, I, you know, started in journalism because that was what I was told was the way that writers make a living, which is hilarious on a lot of levels. But, um, you know, art and arts endeavors were, were never anything that I was told it, it was possible for me to do um, until I read Gwendolyn. So um, that's why she means so much to me. I sit with Gwendolyn. We shuck green peas over large rusty cylinders, over bent ashy knees. Deep in red clay, she smacks my hand. Stop fidgeting, child, focus. She says the names don't matter, the tastes, the planes, the lessons are the same. Distraction spends time, costs lives, fill the bucket. Snap and stop for the sap of green. Snap and feel the round, the rise under forefinger. Snap without stopping. Snap, stop looking down. Peas aren't all seeds. Let the red ground eat. Um, and you know what? I try to sort of prepare poems before readings, um, but I keep it pretty flexible. And I feel like now I have to read a poem that I was probably not going to read um, after Desiree's. Uh, it was one of her crush poems, so I'm going to read it. Uh, it is The Uncanny Valley. Uh, and uh, it is after Kara Walker's A Subtlety at the Domino Sugar Factory. It was in uh, Brooklyn in 2014. It's easy to Google um, just to get a visual of it. They came in between me and the sugar baby, a marvel inside a moment of prayer. Flick of blonde hair, phone in my face, take our photo. Repeat, 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 Kara Walker, do you like cream in your coffee and chocolate in your milk? Right here, still wet air, no space, smiles and crass, snaps of our nipples, our ass, your mammy, our matriarch. This is hip, this is art, this is it, molasses, blanched white, 
You won't. God, you girls like always need a fight. The romance of it, the storytelling, it was so rich and epic. And that was what I hadn't expected. I hadn't expected to be titillated in the way that stories like that are meant to titillate. And at the same time, it was so much fodder for the work that I wanted to do. Kara Walker on exploiting the exploitation and Gone with the Wind. This is church, this is collateral, this is holy terrain, and I'm a phrasis imbued to the frame. Um, and this next poem uh, was in Rhino and it is called Opening Lines. You keep asking where I'm from. I've said New York City twice, twice, second generation. You keep examining like there's no equation, like we somehow began at the sum. Like later, you won't try to impress with a Wu-Tang lyric. Liberty is with a Chappelle set. Like you don't know where we are, what we've built. Like you don't know me. You keep asking where we're from because the hyphen sits, no direction. Like we're still in between. You keep the game going with interrogation. You keep repeating the question. Um, and this next poem. So uh, I, I usually feel like I'm the most goth of poets when I do a reading and then Desiree read, and she's born on Halloween. So I'm not so sure anymore, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna go dark, we're about to go dark. Um, and this poem is called Beloved and it's after Toni Morrison. More than Pop-Tarts, Bruce Banner, my mom's quick wit, our shared triumph, her beam still fighting, so light and irises the color of her skin. Hearing her ignite through the voice of her dog, her delight in playing ventriloquist for the sponge weathering the waves of the strange hide and meat he obediently observed. Her banter, her barking lulled us. More than the smell of blood, peroxide, falling off my dusty pink Mrs. Pac-Man skateboard, the scent of soreness from our laughter, my grounding. I didn't know how much the scars would count. How age would become collage without the speckled blood, blood pavement I could scrape the white off my fingernails, connect the dots on. How I'd forget to mourn the dog she had forgot she buried because it was an accident, because of her baby brother who fought the hallucinations. Scarlet scenes, a beloved, too tuned to this world, sand small peach pills. The interruption quick, a paw wound for tending, small licks needing cleansing, a stove pot toppled over, a house left to bare bone. The exit simple, two wood boxes under red clay, caked cryonic fear when she buried her mother the coming year. The smell of boiled fur hanging, I still remember. The most innocent suffering, the most cruelty. I learned, she prayed. For her, the specifics melted away, hid in the merciful wings of this memory. Panning out, painting a sigh, tethering a glance, she used to be able to do that. But survival required broad strokes with the new slits of irons framing her nose, balancing the weight, my compass struggling to see straight. Um, and I think the last one I'll read from this book is called Reyes. On still Saturdays, I disappear into a plush brown love seat in father's mother's faded beige living room. We'd watch white dead-eyed slashers expose eager glistening bodies, Jason, Freddie, and Michael, mass stowaways I understood to be birthed beneath the Red Atlantic explaining gore and the many doors of no return to a child crying for a way back home. We were one, we were mestizo red, my yellow grandmother and me. The machete sugarcane bled red on the island, dark and Hebrew Salinas poor. Red was the language we spoke, fertile in storied humility. The good red on the mainland, the mixed and othered and ancient and othered, rich got some Indian in me reigning red whose scorn I didn't know then. The, why is your last name Reyes? Is your husband Spanish? This? Then we only had the scripted anodyne red leaking out of the screen. There you go, Desiree. That was for Halloween. 
Um, okay, so I'm gonna read. <laughs> I'm gonna read some quickly. Uh, maybe read uh, some. Uh, maybe two poems um, that are up on Poethead, which is this wonderful website uh, that focuses on Irish uh, female poets. Um, and this one is called Drink Before the War. The bells of St. Finbar, off again. Five faint chimes and warring finches. 2.41 a.m. bird song sculpts slim air. Rollers, tits, a fidgeting pigeon. Crashes on glass ceiling, neck feathers bobbing, weaving, warning. No one with roots doubled under can survive these days. I've tried. I've traveled, I'm tired. Maybe lyrebird or starling, define invasive species. Can't tell if it's a crow or my stomach. God protect me from her sensual coup. Uh, and this last one I'm gonna read is called We Are All Drowned Out. And it starts with an epigraph from Katie Ford. If you respect the dead and recall where they died, by this time tomorrow, there will be nowhere to walk. I believe in ghosts, pray for hauntings. On the road from my grandmother's grave, clipping through terrified reforests, kindershreks and pelting rain, salt and fog through the veil, ether. 11 speeding hours on I-95, I alone wondered. Which lands aren't haunted? South Carolina is hailing blood. Whole orphaned babies, who are the living? Five Points, 290 Broadway, Seneca Falls, New York second only to Charleston, children sold at wet markets, screaming on the block. I hear there's a crying blue baby in Cove, but can no longer hear near the sea. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, that was wonderful. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, gallery view here um, so you can see all of these guys' faces and not just mine. Um, uh, thank you all so much. That those were uh, really incredible readings, and um, uh, I, I've been looking forward to this for uh, for a long time. But um, uh, you guys exceeded uh, my expectations, so thank you um, for that. And um, I know uh, uh, we've got we've got uh, one question so far. So I, I just want to encourage um, those of you who are out there um, uh, tuned in. If you got uh, anything to ask, um, uh, ask away. Uh, the first question uh, is for you, Desiree. Um, it comes from Ariana, who uh, is asking, um, you said someone created a piece of music to Conte Dulce. Um, uh, if, if that is true, um, where might we uh, be able to listen to this piece of music? I'm gonna, you're muted. Um, I just, okay, sorry. Yeah, it was really recently uh, done by Molly Turner and um, she's given me a link, but I don't know that I have permission to make it public, so. Uh... I will, I'll, I'll, I'll post some info on my website if you go to my website and you can uh, stay tuned for that. I, I have, I have a, a fantasy to, to make an animation of the poem and maybe I can persuade Molly to have the music be the joining of the animation. So we'll see, to be continued, but I'll, I'll put my website in the chat. Yeah, I just, I just dropped it in there. Um, uh, so, so Desiree uh, Alvarez, uh, uh, dot, dot com. yeah, yeah. It's a really beautiful piece of music. It's really um, special. Beautiful. Um, th th thank you, uh, Desiree. I, I look forward to, uh, um, to, uh, to hearing that. And, and, and thank you, Ariana, for that question. Um, uh, next question is, is from Greg. Um, how, if in any way, has your approach to poetry changed during shelter in place, COVID, um, et cetera? Uh, I think that's an open question to, to all of you guys, if, if anyone wants to answer. Um. I guess I can start um, <laughs> it dramatic. I would say it's dramatically shifted um, in normal time. In in the normal times, I actually was in the middle of an, uh, finishing up an MFA program here at Fresno State and was working pretty regularly inside the Laureate Lab, a uh, visual artist studio with Juan Felipe. So a lot of the time we were out and moving around and standing up and I didn't actually sit down and write. I would be more likely making things, painting things, building things. So being away from that space has forced me to really shift. So now I'm like using telephone books as my journal and all sorts of bizarre things trying to stay focused. <laughs> 
I, I would say for me, like being able to participate in this and so and, and being mm -hmm. able to attend virtually readings all over the world, it has been just so fantastic. I mean, it's, it's just opened the world in ways um, that, that can never have been anticipated. You know, you can go to like three readings in an evening in different time zones. And it's just, you know, this form is so, so nimble and so magnificently nimble. So that's been that's been the one gift of the pan pandemic. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Desiree. I'll, I'll hop on that. Um, I have, I mean, I, I'm just someone who doesn't stay in one spot naturally. Um, and since we can't safely get on planes, um, the fact that I can do these Zoom readings, I can read, you know, for people back in Ireland, like wherever I'm doing readings, um, the international sort of community. Uh, really feel strong right now. And I feel like that's impacted my writing. And the fact that I can like attend workshops, I mean, you know, I, I'm pretty uh, antisocial, <laughs> quite honestly. And the fact that I can like not have to get on the subway and commute hours and like I can be a part of a Kaveh Kana workshop, it's just amazing. And it means that I'm doing more in some ways that I might have not done before because, you know, I don't I, like my energy, I can stay where I am uh, and don't have to expend as much energy to be a part of, you know, readings and community. and that has actually been a good thing for me. Oh yeah, absolutely agreed on on all fronts there. I've, I've done so many Airbnb experiences and, and webinars. I've learned so much more about the world being uh, shut in my apartment in San Francisco. Um, but um, when, you know, before um, shelter in place and quarantining, I would spend a lot of time running around looking for inspiration for the writing. I was convinced that if I stayed in, at home, I wouldn't see um, what I needed to see to be able to write. And since not being able to leave, um, it, it, it's brought sort of surprising um, focus to the work, maybe because of the urgency of the days going by um, that, that the words have been coming. So I'm sort of surprised by that, but also heartened at the same time. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all for that, uh, your answers. And, and Greg, thanks for that question. Um, the next one is uh, from Julian. It's for Anthony. Um, uh, Julian wants to know, how do you do archival research such as to find that poster? And also how do you conceptualize the archive? Mm. Well, I wanna say, um, a lot of these, a lot of the research was kind of it definitely in bits and pieces, like it's kind of its own reimagining the archive and how I was having to it's a, kind of go through the different like state um, sort of historical societies, county historical societies, even just general websites that of people who are trying to like document things and kind of finding little threads and and going that route. So for me, a lot of it was online. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one, it's one of those things when you start like pulling the thread, you realize you're not just pulling a thread, you're pulling an entire wardrobe out. You know, there's, there's, there's things, there's people, there's stories, there's voices attached to all these things and it just opens up entirely other spaces. So I would say on the other end of conceptualizing what that archive is. I think that was a partial attempt for me in terms of writing the book, of trying to focus on how we need to sort of slow down and sit with the work, sit with the stories, sit with the archives and struggle through it. Um, I look at the book sometimes and think, you know, this isn't easy. Um, it is an easy topic, but it's also sometimes difficult to navigate through. And I'm always appreciative of people willing to kind of take that time and slow down and look and hear and listen deeper. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and um, thank you, Julianne, for the question. Um, uh, this will be a last call uh, for questions. I, I have one, if that's okay, um, since since there, there aren't others yet. I'm. I was for for you, Jayha. I'm I'm wondering about the the program that you coded. I would just love to hear more about your um the idea behind that and um, uh yeah uh, how some of the decisions you made around it. 
Oh, sure thing. Yeah, if um, folks are interested, um, Lillian Yvonne Bertram uh, is an, a poet and educator, and I took a webinar with her called Meaningful Machines. So if you Google that or search that, um, you'll find more information about it. But it's just a, a, a program written in Python, which is sort of a interesting uh, uh, software uh, language to to begin coding in because it's sort of human readable instead of being um, very obtuse. So it's it's good for beginner beginning uh, programming, and it's basically um, like a it operates sort of like a Mad Lib in a way where you put a a structure together. In this case, I use the preamble to the Constitution. And selected uh, selectively left out the nouns and adjectives, and then you find a body of words, uh, you know, either completely random or from a set pool, and then uh, write the program to randomly insert them into the blank spaces. And and what it's really meant to do is, you know, sort of not to write a poem. Like we're not trying to ask technology to write on our behalf. <laughs> That's certainly not what it is. But if you you're a poet, if you're a writer of any kind that has been writing for a while, uh, you probably notice that you fall into certain patterns, like you use the same language patterns over and over again, even when you're trying to break out of them, you fall into them. And so these programs being technology and completely random, they're really able to be <laughs> random in this case in in the way this program is set up and you know in some cases it's um algorithms at work but in this case it's truly random so it can help you break out of the patterns by um inserting that randomness yeah beautiful thank you it's very very interesting and I, I i love the the um the the result that was that was fun it's fun huh <laughs> cool um so uh, uh we've got two more questions um uh the First one um, uh, is um, for Anthony also. And the question is, Anthony, um, how did you come to start writing in the sentence diagram form? Um, good, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, I was just kind of working on the poem itself. The, the, the start of that poem that I shared at the beginning was based literally on me going to the Walgreens, Dwayne Reed trying to get a passport uh, photo to do, uh, I was having to travel and you know that I, so I had this story and it stuck with me for this this event stuck with me for months and months and months and I was drafting some things drafting some things and I went into an art supply store and purchased a comic strip like the old funnies comic strip that is literally I think six by 18 inches and I wrote the first line and you can tell it's a long long title and I just started kind of thinking and going through the ideas of borders and sentence diagrams and all the millions of things that go through our heads the moment like a microaggression starts or we're in the wrong room at the wrong time. And that happened. And then little by little, I started realizing, you know, the, it's, it's not even that linear, right? There's ideas within the ideas. They nest and they spiral out of control. And that's essentially the opening um, that was really codified with a six and an eight, eight, six by 18 comic strip writing path. Awesome. That was uh, uh, really, really uh, enjoyed seeing, seeing that, that, that form, Anthony. Um, uh, uh, keep doing it. It's very cool. Um, so uh, final question um, of the evening, and this is for all of you guys. Uh, this comes from John, who um, is following up on the question about shelter in place. Um, he's wondering, how has the current political climate um, changed your approach to poetry? Uh, I hear much of the political climate embedded and more obvious in poetry. Um, how can poetry respond to this current political climate? I'm a poet and have been stimmied by these times, yet want to respond to the issues. It's a really good question. <laughs> I and I think my answer is is sort of in that 
in that program I wrote, it's sort of like I couldn't find, or like when I wrote, there was so much of my voice in it. And I felt like I was being sort of um, uh, patronizing, patronizing myself. And so I wanted to kind of break out of out of that and, and see what um, what else was possible. You know? I'm, I'm actually teaching a, a class called Citizenship, Art and Politics right now. So we're reading a, a ton of political poetry and just poetry by marginalized communities and short fiction and all kinds of things. Um, so, I mean, I feel like, I feel like poetry is so condensed and intense that it's a really wonderful form for sharing in a, in a, in a community like a classroom or, or even in a, in a March protest situation. I think uh, it, it has great potential and scope with that concision and economy. And I think because of that, it can be maximally subversive. So I think we're, we're all on the true path. And I, I use that word true carefully. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll just say, uh, that's a really tough question to answer concisely, but um, I feel like every single thing that I say is political, everything that I want to say is political, and that's always been the case. And I've always been, you know, I'm a, I was always sort of confused when people would say things like, oh, I, you know, I don't follow politics or I'm not a political person. I'd be like, what a luxury that is, you know? I mean, for some of us, it's just kind of not an option. Uh, like our survival is based on following politics. And I don't say that as an attack. I say that as, you know, it's been interesting to see during this particular administration more than any other in my lifetime. Now I feel like everybody sort of understands that we are all involved in this and we all play a part, whether, you know, whatever part that is on whatever scale, whatever, uh, I don't know, I guess sort of like seesaw of oppressor, oppressed, like you're still participating whether you know it or not. And I feel like people are starting to finally get that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just say like, like write, like write the things that mean something to you. Like, I feel like a lot of my poetry recently is like about, it's a lot of like eco-political poetry. And even when I find myself writing about like crows, like it's political. You know what I mean? Like I'm writing about how like the crows are like being segregated from the swans or, you know what I mean? Like, I felt like, I'm like, oh my God, you're still writing your same poem. But like the, the truth is I can't not write politically. Um, and so, yeah, I just feel like, I guess maybe I don't, I don't really notice such a difference in my poetry as much as I do see other people um, being more comfort comfortable to embrace and feel like they have a space in the so-called political scene, which I find encouraging because I'm like, guys, whether you like it or not, you're involved and, you know, take up your space. So, yeah. Um, I guess per, for me personally, right, I've been working on poems that are around, once I finished this collection, I was actually working on poems around the Dust Bowl and climate change and a little bit more focused on like whiteness and annihilation. So it's been, <laughs> It's been a difficult thing to sort of approach right now because I can, I feel like every day we are working towards some sense of annihilation. And I never know if that's, if that's something I'm gonna ever be finished with. So I, so it's like a struggle, a day-to-day a day -day struggle for me. Um, I think I, I, I echo kind of what Kimberly's saying in terms of, on the larger scale of our work in general of everything kind of being political, everything being a work towards remembering because how easy it is for us not to remember and to sort of participate in like revisionist history where, oh, this is, oh, now look how terrible it is. Well, you know, if you don't throw out dates like 1492, 1619, 1848, it's, it's happening, it's happened, and it still continues to happen. So kind of those acts to remember the things in our own life and our, our complicity or, our, or how we have been silenced and trying to put that out into the world is its own sort of act. So thanks, That's a, that is a heavy question, it's a hard question.
thank you all for it, for answering it and and thank you um thank you for asking that question um uh thank you thank you all um uh thank you to 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 you, to you poets for um for being here and, and sharing your time and your, your words with us um this has really been a lovely evening and, and um i want to thank uh, everybody at, at home uh wherever you're watching from um from for tuning in um for asking great questions and um and also especially for for buying all all of these writers books uh from booksmith specifically um the links again are in the chat and also below the video um uh, I encourage you to follow these guys into the future um, as, as they take us boldly where we need to go. And um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's it for me. Just another, um, uh, another uh, I need to, to tell you to vote again if you haven't done that. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's what it's all about. Yes, that's right. Um, thank you. Um, this has been a true treat for me and, and I hope for all of you as well. Um, hopefully we can all gather in person um, at some point in the nearest future, but um, I'm grateful that, that we're able to meet here. Uh, no, it might not have been possible to, to be with you, Kimberly and Desiree, um, otherwise. Um, so, uh, so I'm grateful for, for this at least. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, for spending the night with us and um, take care, be well, and uh, yeah, vote. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>